Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road to the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and whether anybody can think of another word that rhymes with orange. At a corner table by the fire are three people. One of them is trying to construct a life-size statue of John Elway out of Lego, but has just run out of orange bricks. And that's me, Matthew Meloma, and welcome to Believe to See, a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Here at Believe to See, we explore the relationship between faith, art, and storytelling. Our goal is to help you connect the great story, the great stories, in our own stories in order to understand what it means to live with a Christian imagination. So it's a cliche, uh, a cliche about artists that we want to have our artistic freedom to cast off the old shackles of convention and throw them in the faces of the censors, to prance through the meadow of liberty without restraint, arms held aloft on the winds of possibility, a white blank page, an empty plane of infinite possibilities. Surely that is the artist's greatest friend. Again, that would probably be how most folks on the street would assume artists feel. But here's the thing. The more I work at actually creating art, you know, actually telling stories, the more I'm convinced that it's actually the opposite that's true. The best way to create a story isn't boundless possibilities, it's limits. The more restrictions you place on an artistic process, the easier it is for creativity to flourish. At least, that's what I think, and I'll try to give a wide swath of examples from different areas to show this. And it won't just be me doing that. I also have my two co-hosts here, Evangeline and Christina. Evangeline, how are you doing? I'm doing well, but I'm a little concerned that you've roped us into yet another conversation about outlines. <laughs> oh, do you think those will come up? <laughs> oh, funny. Like, oh, I, funny didn't even, I didn't even consider that when we talked about the show. And then your little intro, and I'm like, oh no, we're talking about outlines, aren't we? <laughs> what, a, what, a Dang it. <laughs> what a crazy random happenstance. That must have just been an accident. Um, uh, Christina, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm excited, although not excited that my first um, my first moment on this uh, particular track was a snort of laughter. <laughs> oh, there's nothing wrong with so, that. You know, so, hi guys, I'm here. <laughs> so do you want to hear something? So fr from my intro, you may have caught this. I, I asked whether another word rhymes with orange. That's yes. because, you know, it's it's yeah. uh, one of those things you learn in elementary school that nothing rhymes with orange. Mm -hmm. I heard an interview with Eminem, <laughs> and he was pushing back on that thought. He thought that he could come up with words that did rhyme with orange. Okay. The example he gave was door hinge. Orange. Hinge. I think that's close enough. Orange. Door hinge. Door hinge. Door, it has to be door, door hinge. hinge. Door hinge. Oh, door orange. Door, door hinge. hinge. Yes. I, th I think it works. I think Depending on where you put the emphasis and if that's important to you, I think it works. Yeah. One of the spokespeople of my generation, Eminem. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, let's get to talking about limits. So this is one of my ideas that I presented at like our podcast team meeting and felt like I had to do some convincing to convince our producer, Jesse, that this was a decent idea. So let's get initial reactions. Uh, Evangeline. When I first made my little pitch about limits being good, did you agree with it? Did you resist it? What, what were your initial thoughts? I probably would, you know, if I hadn't given it much thought, fall on the side of the, you know, just person on the street that you mentioned in your intro, um, who's just like, oh, no, um, you know, the blank page, freedom, um, that's the creative's best friend. But, um, you know, the way you pitched it and the more I thought about it and even the more I kind of looked at my own writing journey and, and other things. Um, yes, I, I am maybe halfway to being convinced. Halfway to being convinced. Okay, I will <laughs> take it. How about you, Christina? Um, absolutely, actually. I think that limits absolutely need to be there. However, um, I am definitely of the opinion that the more limits you self-impose in the beginning, the more freedom will come naturally later. No. Mm. Okay. Good thought. So I think what we will do is we'll take turns going through some examples we found. And I, I know I tried to 
draw from as many different like disciplines as possible for this. And I think it works for a lot of different disciplines. But let, I'll start, since again, this is sort of my little soapbox thing. And the thing that got me thinking about this particular one has to do with the Hayes Code. Uh, so, for listeners who may not have it top of mind, uh, the Hayes Code was this uh, set of industry guidelines of self-censorship that Hollywood imposed on itself uh, between, let's see, 1934 to 1968. Now, the reason they did it is because Hollywood before that time was becoming increasingly seen as being uh, morally lax and uh, basically a, a scourge on society. And it was in many respects. But to, to sort of nip that in the bud, they, the motion picture industry thought, okay, because these government regulators are coming for us, we'll regulate ourselves to try to like show them that we're on board. So they came out with this code that frankly seems a little silly to us, to most of us now. Uh, so for example, some of the many things in the code include, um, well, well, let me start with the, the overall uh, overriding principles, where basically their goal of the code was to set in principles that would not, uh, I love this, <laughs> they would not lower the moral standards of those who see the films, <laughs> and they did not want to influence specific audiences, including women, children, the lower class, oh, and dear. those of susceptible minds. <laughs> oh dear. That oh, dear. is problematic. Oh dear. <laughs> So we're not off to a great start. No, we are not. So those are the goals. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> those are the goals. And um, to oh, do man. that, they had this very long set of rules that you weren't allowed to do. So they included, among many others, that in every movie, the law cannot be defeated. Like the cops, the, the criminal can't get away. The cops have to catch him. Uh, you aren't allowed to show for a woman the, the inside of their thigh. The woman cannot have lace lingerie. There can't be any exposed... <clears throat> The term of art they use is bosom. Uh, there's no drinking. There's no narcotics. You can't show a dead uh, dead body. There's no gambling. You can't point a gun at a screen at the TV screen, and you can't have a Tommy gun at all. We well, also can't show a husband and wife in bed together, right? Like, like. The, so there were there was a set of strict rules, and then they're like standards that developed over time. Oh, I, I would okay. imagine that okay. that comes in. As well, okay. uh, especially when you're talking at a uh, at sitcom. So basically, like that's why they had like the separate beds in yeah. all those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So sitcoms. So yeah. basically, yeah. some of these rules you can see why if you want to convince the government that you're not corrupting the youth, you do. <laughs> some of the rules, uh, most of the rules are silly. Some of the rules were just flat out bad. Like for instance, there was uh, a rule that you can't have like a white person date a black person. So some of that is just flat out bad. That is bad and wrong. So yes. I would say. Looking at the Hayes Code, I would describe it as mostly silly, with a few things that are bad. A few things you can argue are okay, but it's mostly silly to bad, okay? <laughs> well, I want to make this clear. I am not defending the Hayes Code. However, one of the weirdest examples of a movie being saved was saved by the Hayes Code. So let's go to Casablanca. One of my favorite movies ever. One of the most influential movies ever made. For those of you who don't know how the movie ends, well, first of all, this can came you, out... Matt, I'm so sorry. Can you, can you give us the date it was made first? Oh, the date it was made. Absolutely, I can. Thank you. Yes, I can. The and... date the Hayes Code was made or the date... Oh, no, 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 Casablanca. Okay. Yeah. Casablanca is 1942. 42, okay. I thought so... it was the 40s, but I, I can't remember. Yep, so Thank right you. is World War II is getting, getting all ramped up. So technically, eight years initially after the Hayes Code was kind of founded. I'm just kind yeah. of trying to like think yeah, through so timeline it's, it's stuff. In the, it's in the thick of the Hayes Code. In the thick of it, yeah. Okay, and if you cool. watch some of these movies made during the Hayes Code, knowing the Hayes Code was in effect, it makes a lot of stuff make a lot more sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but anyway, so again, I'm kind of sorry if I'm spoiling the plot, but also it's 80 years old, guys. You had time to watch it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Humphrey funny. Bogart is this really cool <laughs> bar owner Rick in Casablanca, the city in Morocco, where like Nazis and freedom fighters and Vichy France are all, it's this hodgepodge. And Rick fall, meets an old flame, Elsa, played by Ingrid Bergman, and they, they really want to run back away together. But Elsa is married to this kind of lame but very... 
very smart freedom fighter <laughs> who's like key to the war effort. And he knows that if he runs away with Elsa, it will be wrong and it, lots of people will be affected. So he decides to be, do the selfless thing and let her go. And it's beautiful. In the, in the original version, Rick and Elsa just ran away together. Uh -huh. hmm. However, because of the Hays Code, they can't do that. It's immoral. Just the, the lady sitting in the back of the church is shaking her head at it. <laughs> so because of that, they had to rework it where Rick does not do this immoral thing. And doing it totally made the whole movie work. Hmm. Because throughout the whole movie, Rick is he's just jaded by the world. He put himself out there to love Elsa back in the past. And he got burned by it. So he's like, I'm not sticking my neck out for anybody. I'm not looking out for anyone. And then toward, toward the end, to show his character arc, he lets Elsa go. So he, and he does the selfless thing for the greater good of others. So it's like this perfect character arc that would not have existed if not for the Hayes Code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So any, anybody think we should re-up re some parts of the Hayes Code? You know, at least the Tommy Gun thing and the... <laughs> <laughs> It's, you know, it's <laughs> dangerous so, ground you're uh, so walking on you there. Can't, so, again, I don't know what to make of it. Because, again, I view the Hayes Code as mostly silly, sometimes flat out wrong. And, but yet it led, those weird restrictions led to mm -hmm. a movie being made lots and lots better. Like, you mm -hmm. get these smart writers, be like, okay... We want our character to run off with the hot chick, but we can't. Mm -hmm. So we need to make him not run off with the hot chick so it works. And that is a better ending. Mm -hmm. it's, it has more attention. It has more meaning. Yes. It, you know, there's sacrifice there. Um, more of the noble human virtues on display because they had to jump through some hoops. Yeah, the, the normal way to go is be like, all right. Let's have the two hot people end up together. Right. Yeah. But because that was taken off the table because of this sort of mm. silly moral code, they had to go beyond the easy one to the more complicated one. That's where they landed on the on the good solution. Right. And again, not not condoning <laughs> the reason that they had to do that. Just saying that sometimes adversity, yeah. um, you know, makes you work harder. Or challenges just present opportunity. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Matt, I'm just curious, as far as this, like, do you know how far into the scripting process and the, the, the acting, like, when they hired the, like, how far were they into all that before they had to say, wait a minute, we can't do that? Do you know? I don't. I okay. don't. And you... Because you think, I mean, sorry. You think know. they'd know that right from the start, right, right? Right, So I think there's some sort of gray areas with the Hayes Code. As you can imagine, like, people would try to push the limits. So, like, there was a Hayes Code limitation where uh, two people can't be kissing for more than three seconds at a time. Right. So then Alfred Hitchcock got around this, like, okay, kiss for three seconds, then you stop. Then you go for three more seconds, <laughs> yes. then you stop. So there are yeah. ways to get around it, and yeah. sometimes the censors would buy it, sometimes they wouldn't. Right, yeah. right. I think I saw that example somewhere recently. It made me laugh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, again, if you watch right. movies from this time period knowing the Hayes Code is in effect, it makes everything make more sense. Like, wow, the law sure did close in on this cool criminal right at the end. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's because they had to, because it's the Hayes Code. Yeah. Actually, um, what makes me laugh now thinking about it is those, those romantic kisses. 30s, 40s, 50s movies. Yes. It's like, jam your faces together, and then throw yourselves apart. <laughs> yep. <laughs> One, two, two three. Throw apart. Throw yourselves apart. <laughs> I was always like, do people, people don't Think kiss. of the children. <laughs> Think of the children in the lower classes. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so awful. <laughs> that makes so much more sense. I love this now. This Any is good information to have. <laughs> Anywho, uh, Hayes Code. Uh, yeah. Oh, man. Don't trust your government, kids. Um, Evangeline. <laughs> I don't trust what's, your government. What is your example of limits creating art? Well... From a work or just like kind of like still kind of working off of the Hayes Code? If you have something Hayes adjacent, I would let, let's hear okay. it. Okay. Well, I was just thinking, like, I don't have a specific example, but I was just thinking um, of how, you know, like, I'm not comfortable writing bedroom scenes. 
That's, what scene? I'm sorry. Like bedroom scene. Oh, bedroom like, scene. Right. Not, I'm just not comfortable for myself personally. Oh, sure. And I'm so... not comfortable with any character showing any affection to each other. So <laughs> I get where you're coming from. Yeah. So there's a continuum, and you, you are on one side. Novels. He needs haze codes for novel writers. I have my own codes. <laughs> like they don't even shake hands. Right. <laughs> they kind of like look at each other, like just in passing, and they're like, <laughs> "Yeah, okay." They just feel like a little nod, like yeah, exactly. Out, like, You'll do. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, of the books that I am talking about, the like yes. see me, you know, romance, oh, for sure. like that's just not. To be fair, 98% of those scenes are awful. Yeah, that's true. Yes. <laughs> Having read, no, I'm not. <laughs> I was going to say, where's that person? Where's that coming from? <laughs> that person, that's why he's, un- he's read so many of them. That's why he loves <laughs> right? Nope, this you one's bad. You don't know about <laughs> my Harlequin romance pen name, obviously. Um, <laughs> No. <laughs> but anyway, you were saying. <laughs> no shade to those authors. It's just not for me. Um, so that makes um that makes it more challenging, obviously, writing um, you know, romantic tension and all of that. And I personally love that challenge because I love to dig into the words, use all the, you know, tools in my vocabulary box, um, you know, to really pull out that emotion and that, you know, physical tension without having that resort because that's just that's just not for me so that's what it made me think of when you were when we talked about figuring out a way to make it serve the story and be compelling without it just being like titillating right yeah yeah and you know in our episode i don't know when it will air in terms of um you know um order but we were talking about romantic tension in one of our Mm -hmm. um previous um podcasts and how that is a tool for writers to um to keep the tension going throughout the story so mm-hmm. i think it's mm-hmm. useful like i would rather have that tool at my disposal yeah. at my disposal right. to be able to you know keep that tension rather than ruin it <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know with that scene but that's me Yep, and I I do think a lot of times those scenes are more effective when you shoot for the higher virtues, the the relationship between the characters, the overall mm-hmm. service to the story, rather than right. doing you know the Casablanca thing. Two hot people end up together, right? Yes. When you go beyond that, you usually yes. get something more compelling. I mean, we have certainly yeah. read that story, seen that story, and yeah. you know, it's just more interesting to have the emotional depth. Yes, yeah, and have the romantic chemistry. You can do that. Mm-hmm. You really can. You know, yeah, you really can. All right, Christina, now it is your turn. Well, um, well, you have notes right in front again? of you. What, 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 were, what were you writing down? Nothing. These were notes from many moons ago. <laughs> <laughs> she just randomly pulled out old notes. And I, well, hey, I just keep maybe random notebooks notebook, Maybe this everywhere. notebook will be helpful. Actually, dude, seriously, though, Let's I have see. so many. Look, just March, my type. March of 2012. Here we go. Yeah. What was I thinking? <laughs> Hey, uh, it does say, towards the sky, a whole gathering host of them, brave enough to greet the sa 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 something something stars hiding behind the day's blue hoose. There we go. See, it was just a creative well, there we go. notebook of so, me messing so around. Let, let me uh, let, let me try to re. I'll, I'll sort of lob, lob this up to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, throw it back. Throw any, it back. Any examples you thought of where creating limits uh, helped foster a, a work of art? Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely that's just like, I think in, in, in reality and in real artists' lives, that just abounds, um, you know. And, but I think if we were to go, I guess, back to just, I guess, my own, my own personal writing, um, I would just, I, I would go back to this one point where my friend and I did this book together called The, the Writer's Workshop. And I'm trying to remember... I don't remember the author. I should. <clears throat> but anyway, he made you he made us, as the people going through this book, um, read a whole bunch of old works um of literature and then go back and write, try to like write like this author. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was brilliant and it was hard and delightful. And the whole process, the whole point was like you can't know how to write unless you have practiced not only like limiting yourself in certain ways you express things or describe things but 
until you try to put yourself in someone else's voice until you it's, it's that's kind of how you find your own and it's not by being brilliant it's not by having this great landscape of ideas and opportunities it's by putting in the work to imitate before you mm -hmm. create and so for me imitating is 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 really helpful mm -hmm. um not if i do it for too long because then i just i'm like i i feel lost but it's a really good way to kind of get a handle on oh hold on a sec i also have a, a dear friend who um he did this great thing called um, writer's blocks, and he did a, a real legit um, block. He gave me a Christmas present, and he just cut a whole bunch of wood blocks, and then he took a Sharpie, and he wrote little things on them, and he put it in a little bag, and he said, for when you get writer's block, pull out one of these and write a paragraph. <laughs> and so <laughs> it was legitimately um, adorable and wonderful and brilliant, but also extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. Because when you're trying to, like, deal with that vast expanse of, I have a whole novel, like, that I'm trying to figure out and draft and write, and this chapter's not coming together, pull out one of these cute little Scrabble tile blocks and write a little couple sentences about your left sock. Like, legitimately, that's how funny and that's how random it was. And you do, you narrow in kind of on mm -hmm. your field, you put that limitation, and all of a sudden you find that your words are coming back, you're flowing again. You have this, like, it's not this grand, like, yes, anyway, mysterious blank page that you're trying to cultivate. It, it's an of. exercise in determination. It I mean, really is. Both your examples, which I love both of them, the, you know, imitation. Um, I think that's part of any artist. That's part of your training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard and it really goes against the grain of, you know, how creative writing is usually taught. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, just, you know, go with what is interesting to you, mm -hmm. um, you know, find your own voice, find your own voice, mm -hmm. when in fact, the opposite is true. Just like you said, imitating the, the masters is how you learn. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's an act of fortitude and will, yeah. which in the same way, the, um, you know, the, the little tiles with the remind, the little writer's block things uh -huh. it's the same thing it's just like a trick of like mm -hmm. a mind trick yeah of, it's a playful way to do the same thing to make yourself be determined and sit down and yep. and do the work yeah. so it's interesting how those are both kind of i think acts of will yeah which is what and limitations that like, yeah. are imposed that yeah actually... which is what you have to have if you're going to make a piece of art that's meaningful despite certain restrictions that might be on you, be mm -hmm. they silly or damaging or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. If, I think I've used this example before. If I were to tell either of you, like, okay, you have 30 minutes, write a story. That's the only guidance. Mm -hmm. You'd probably spend most of the time like, sorry, I don't want, to, you know, like looking around like a <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, lamp. I, I don't know. Uh, I probably would. I'd but, legitimately look around the room told, and say. <laughs> but if I told you, Write a story about a pigeon who runs for mayor of New York. You guys would probably be able to do it, and you'd probably be like, oh, idea, 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 because mm -hmm. I gave fair. you those limits mm -hmm. of all the universe of subjects. Here's one kind of, here's two silly limits, right? Mm -hmm. A pigeon, mayor of New York, boom, and that's enough to get you going. I love that. Like yeah. it, it it's like a funnel for all the creative energy mm -hmm. goes down this one chute now. Yeah, I do love that visual too, like a funnel for the creativity mm -hmm. to go down a chute, like to, it really does. Limitations, it is funny because I think if you really want to play like theology with it, you can say, yeah, man wasn't meant to play God. And once we start thinking that we are, our creativity just <laughs> breaks down. <laughs> Mary Shelley. <laughs> there you go. She's Frankenstein. right there. Frankenstein. I there mean, if is. you don't have limits, you end up with Frankenstein. Amen. Mary Shelley Which for the win. did not go well. No. 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 It was not, you know harmonious the monster <laughs> the, right, the monster <laughs> the work yeah. of literature is wonderful the monster <laughs> yeah you know not so great because we were ignoring some limits that we should have imposed <laughs> 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 you know, we do not play god we, not play yes. god. <laughs> we do not make human creature things <laughs> in our own in our, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> love that book all right, so here's one, and Evangeline, you, you, you accused me of trying to smuggle in outlines versus mm. non-outlines into this, and I, I reject your accusation, <laughs> but okay. I'm going to read a passage that I literally read on a past show we did about outlining, because <laughs> I love it so much. Um, so, G.K. Chesterton, Man Who Was Thursday, 
in the opening chapter, there's this debate between two poets. One's kind of this anarchist poet of, you know, like disorder. His name's Gregory. And the other one is Syme, and he's just sort of the, the Chesterton stand in almost the, the poet of order. They're talking about the, the true purpose of, of poetry or of art. So here's Gregory, the, the anarchist poet. He says, An artist disregards all governments, abolishes all conventions. The poet delights in disorder only. If it were not so, the most poetical thing in the world would be the Underground Railway. So it is, said Mr. Syme. So then Gregory talks about how that's so stupid. Why are all the clerks <laughs> so depressed at the railway station? It's because they, they know the railway station is always going to go to the right way. And then Syme responds, It is you, Gregory, who are unpoetical. If what you say of clerks is true, they can only be as prosaic as your poetry. The rare, strange thing is to hit the mark. The gross, obvious thing is to miss it. We feel it is epical when man with one wild arrow strikes a distant bird. Is it, not e is it not also epical when man with one wild engine strikes a distant station? Chaos is dull, because in chaos the train might indeed go anywhere, to Baker Street or to Baghdad. But man is a magician, and his whole magic is in this, that he does say, Victoria, and lo, it is Victoria! <laughs> No, take your books of mere poetry and prose. Let me read a timetable with tears of pride. <laughs> so the po I mean, so obviously we're uh, we're giving GK some poetic license here. Got but some his, going, his, yeah. pro his point is clear where having the limits, like you need to hit this target is what's exciting, right? Mm hmm. When you're playing a game of basketball, it's not exciting if you throw the ball wherever you want and it lands wherever. It's exciting if you shoot the ball and it goes precisely in the one spot where it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. In the same way, if you're creating a work of art and you hit your exact mark, that's what's exciting, not just going anywhere the wind takes you. I'm thinking of Luke Skywalker and the... <laughs> you know the death star the mm -hmm. one tiny exactly, little target that he exactly. has to hit you know oh that exactly. yes yes right, right. <laughs> you're thinking yes yes wouldn't there be damage if you like but no it has to be that <laughs> it has to be that right one there target. yes yep <laughs> yeah but but though matt can you um just can we just like make sure when we're talking about this like make a differentiation between goal and limitation you start mm -hmm. talking about basketball you start talking about sports you start talking about like you need a place to go and like yes but everyone who's trying to be creative wants a product that almost sounds like end product sort of mm -hmm. so yes but where are we going with like limitations imposed on the way we create our end product yeah so i think part of this and i think this will get us into our next conversation uh subtopic we're talking about like meter and rhyme and poetry where having rules set up at the outset are what make it exciting so so let's go back to the sports analogy sports are only exciting because there's a set of agreed upon rules that you have to follow you know in basketball or any other sport your movement is restricted right you can only move if you have the ball you can only move in a certain way you can only uh, shoot at a certain target you can only defend a certain way it's those limits that make it interesting whereas if it was everyone you know just right. play the game of your heart it, right. it's, it's right. not going to be interesting at all even though the heart is still trying to get the ball into the net it's not interesting if they're not the limitations of the rules and you know along the way that says nope you can't do that oh crap now it's the other team's ball kind of thing yeah in I'm going for a related point that this could be just me because i i've tried writing poetry in the past i've never been especially prolific i complete maybe one or two poems in my life but for me if you're to t if you someone is telling me okay matt write a sonnet I'd be like okay i know what i'm doing there there's the, the rhyme scheme the meter everything i i can get going i feel confident it's like matt write a poem open verse just whatever you want it's like oh i can't <laughs> that the fact that there are no rules would make me feel just totally out to sea Hmm. Um, uh, Avinash, I think you were talking about rhyme and meter and poetry too. I was. I just kind of I did a refresher because this was never my um, strength in college. Mm -hmm. I was always better at prose. I love poetry, um, but I don't think that the you know the meter is what connects with me. It's always the words. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to kind of go back to that. Go back to my English classes when they were talking about. Mm -hmm iambic pentameter and all of that and but you know 
the way that the poets, you know, the masters, Shakespeare, you know, um, Don, use their words within those forms. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, nobody could argue that they're masters at both that craft and at, at their wordsmithing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just something that I was looking into, like I said, as we were getting ready for this. And um, of course, we're all pretty familiar with iambic pentameter, at least because, you know. And that's, I think, like you learned that in high school and then like go over it with Shakespeare. Um, but I was looking at um, Keats. La Belle de Sans Merci, yes, which is... What is it um, called, sorry? Um, I'm not, I cannot speak French, but <laughs> La Belle de Sans Merci. Okay. La Belle de Sans Merci. Right. La Belle de Sans Merci. Yes, there we go. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> terrible. <laughs> terrible. Not... <laughs> I have zero French knowledge, but anyway, keep going. Yes. <laughs> um, but anyway, it is iambic trimeter and tetrameter. Mm. So... As I was like just reading through the ballad, which is about a um, beautiful fairy woman who enchants the night, I was struck with how the the rhyme and the meter, not the rhyme, but the meter, um, feels kind of lulling. Mm. So I'll just read like a couple um, stanzas, and hopefully I will do like justice to it. Probably not, but. So it just begins, <clears throat> Oh, what can ail thee, night at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, night at arms, so haggard and so woe-begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest done. I see a lily on thy brow, what anguish moist and fever do, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. You love that, like, mm -hmm. that, like, triameter, which would be three, and tetrameter, which would be four, just kind of gives that back and forth mm -hmm. sway. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. like, picturing the knight on the, or the, you know, the knight on the horseback, and then he puts the lady on there. And just that flow and that back and forth and that lulling that makes me think of a spell, a fairy spell. So oh, nice. I was just thinking, like, how even that you know, limiting structure in the hands of a master like Keats adds to the overall theme mm -hmm. and effect mm -hmm. of the poem. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and absolutely, I, again, my card's on the table. I think I made my grumpy old man position on this very clear. I love rhyme and meter and poetry. I, yes, I think it's very useful. I think it's something that should be more widespread than it is but one of the reasons is it can add to the to the experience of the poem like like you said it, it kind of adds this this rhythm this sway you almost feel yourself moving with the rhythm of the words it almost simulates the way that the the main character is moving there and mm -hmm. also it's it's easier for the audience to pick up on mm -hmm. because yeah. they can sort of join into it Mm -hmm. And if if you want to memorize poems like that, um, it's a lot easier too. And you know, like, mm -hmm. okay, I know you're just trying to think. Okay, I know this at three three feet here. Blah blah blah. Okay, okay, okay. So it, it's a lot easier to wrap your head around on the readership side, knowing that mm -hmm. the the poem is already bound by limit. Mm -hmm. Well, that made me think of like you know the art of oral storytelling mm -hmm. and how we wonder, at least I wonder, you know, these stories that are so old and have were part of the oral tradition before mm -hmm. they were written, you know, how much is the same and how much is different than it was mm -hmm. originally. But if you had, you know, whatever meter the poet in that, you know, culture used, um, there probably was a lot that was similar because for mm -hmm. that very fact, because it was easier to memorize. And so that makes me think there's probably a lot that at least similar to what it was back then, mm -hmm. which is yeah. exciting to me. <laughs> yeah, and it's the <laughs> yeah. same thing with the oral storytelling where not all conventions, but a lot of conventions become the conventional wisdom for a reason, right? Because right. generations of storytellers know like, okay, mm -hmm. this is what you do. Here's, you need the memory aids. Here's the memory aid. You want to get the audience's attention, repeat this line, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those limits that are imposed 
again, not all of them, but a, a, a lot of them are limits because throughout the years they've shown like, this is how you get and keep an audience's attention. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even small things just like, um, you know, because a lot of the, <clears throat> the stories and the epics and the poems that we know now, um, you know, were originally sung. So even some mm-hmm. of those, you know, limitations there, mm-hmm. yeah, with even some of the rhyming and, and even some of that we don't have now because, you know, original, well, even a lot of the, the Hebrew um, from scripture, apparently, you know, mm-hmm. so much more beautiful I mean, musical mm-hmm. in that language, in Hebrew, mm-hmm. than it is to the English, um, English, yeah, English, American, us. <laughs> These two people in this room, that's all I'm saying. Okay. In our. She texts, wait, this... what, what language am I speaking <laughs> yes. now? I don't know. <laughs> Check in with reality. Check in with reality. It's still English. Where am I? <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, yeah, just th- there's a difference. And so I think uh, all I'm trying to say is, is there is something to be said for limitations, for the way things sound, for the way mm-hmm. things are measured and numbered. It makes them, it just makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. and it is interesting when you think that the lots of prominent examples are found in the Bible of using these limitations where. I think a lot of ways that Christians sort of have this knee-jerk way of talking about the Bible is if it's just like a, a collection of data points. Mm-hmm. Uh, when that's actually not what it is like, look at the Psalms. It, they, they're not just giving data about theological propositions. It's <laughs> right, told right. in poetry. Like mm-hmm. there's repetition, mm-hmm. repetition that you don't need to do it to get your theological point across necessarily. You do it right. to communicate other more complicated truths in, in some mm-hmm. ways. Or like Psalm 119, it's written as an acrostic. Yeah. That must have been really hard. Right? That's <laughs> a imagine? lot of limitations on yeah. what you're able to say. But obviously, the psalmist thought it was worthwhile. Yeah. And yeah. myths. Yeah. Just the, the amount of stories that are, you know, included in scripture and mm-hmm. parables and myths. And mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it's not an accident. Yeah, you'll, you know, if you, like, dig into the myths of any, like, specific culture, you'll see little bits and pieces repeated, mm-hmm. even in, like, different stories, like, descriptors, yeah. especially. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And you're like, okay, you know, it makes you pay attention because yeah. you've seen it before. It does make you pay attention. And so, yeah, I mean, that would have been a tool for the storyteller, and the audience would know as well. I mean, it just clues you in because you're, you know conditions you've been taught. Yeah, and a lot of those limitations come from the fact that the sort of medium that they were using was a limited medium, yes. right? It's yeah. mm-hmm. limited by the amount that a storyteller can remember mm-hmm. and easily recite, Yep. and it's limited by the amount that an audience can listen to and understand. Mm-hmm. And even in oral cultures, they were way better at a lot of this stuff than we are today, sure. but there's still a limit there, and that, that just... Human biology is is something that that can be a limiting factor. And uh, that kind of leads me to another point that I was thinking about, and that is just limitations in the medium itself. You know, like Mm -hmm. some of these things, you know, some of the members of the Arts Guild for Anselm are like watercolor painters. Like, okay, watercolor, that's that's limiting because the way that like color moves across the page, all that. Um, The one I was thinking of, it shows that I have young children, is lego okay hear me out here <laughs> um i was watching this really interesting documentary about legos called the brickumentary and one of the points they're making because you know they're showcasing you know master builders people who make like fine art like really really beautiful things using lego yeah yeah and one of the points they made was that lego you can make a lot of stuff with it but it's still limited right there's a finite number of things you can do with the lego pieces right mm-hmm. to, to take one example yeah the one by five piece, the one that's one one little uh, stud uh, deep and five mm-hmm. long, mm-hmm. that doesn't exist. There is no one by five. So, so this is kind of fun. Uh, so uh, they're talking about, sorry, this is a digression having to do with the one by five. Uh, <laughs> so they're talking about like conventions of like Lego master builders and not all, but a good portion of the Lego master builders are dudes. Not all, but a good portion of them are, are rather nerdy. Would, we fully support nerds on this podcast. Mm-hmm. When you get a convention of mostly nerdy guys, it is unusual that there are girls there who <laughs> get the attention of them. So the code word that they have among the Lego community for a hot girl there oh, no. is a one by five. <laughs> I was 
say it's a one by five. It's a one by five because they don't exist. <laughs> they don't exist. So, that just uh, 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 underscores <laughs> there are limitations for Lego. If you need a one by five to do a build, guess what? It doesn't exist. You need to figure out a way around it. Uh, lots of other things. There's these little bricks. You need to figure out solutions for yourself. And a lot of the creativity of Lego is figuring out solutions around the limitations of the medium. And that's actually a big source of a lot of creativity, like using pieces in unusual ways or using a piece meant for a purpose X for purpose Y instead. That was never even envisioned. That's where the creativity comes in. Using this sort of finite thing to make a whole, uh, a whole host of things. For sure. Lego was clearly night, never my medium, because I could only ever make a house. <laughs> <laughs> a square house. <laughs> Were, were either of your boys into Lego? Like my oldest has okay. in like insane Lego structures. Okay, massive, nice. massive. They like. Nice. I think the last one took him like got it at Christmas, and it was maybe three, four weeks, and that was working on it every single day. I mean, yeah. like yeah. they're insane. I. I could never have the patience to do them, <laughs> but he's phenomenal at them. So yeah. that's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that brings me to just like in general, when you think more deeply about the question of like, you know, sub creating versus creating ex nihilo, and is some of the greatest create like creations have come from the, um, the most limitations. And some of the most famous, you know, I'm thinking for for some reason I'm thinking of interior design. And I don't have any any like like examples off the top of my head, but like some of the most famous builds and designs um, or whatever were done because there was such a limitation to the space, mm -hmm. and so there was so much innovation as well as creativity that went into yeah. it. Um, and so all of a sudden you're seeing all these things that you wouldn't have expected to see because there was so much limit that that humanity or this you know designer was sort of backed up against. No, but, that, that totally makes sense because, like, interior designing seems like it, it's one of those things where the limitations are basically what make the art form function, right? Right. Because you, you know, need them. Pe yeah, people yeah, you can't aren't not just have in four walls limitless, or, you know, yeah, whatever. They're yeah. not in limitless <laughs> warehouses, right? They're yeah. in this particular space with particular sets, like, here's mm -hmm. where the light comes in, here's where the window is. And you here's have where to work with are. the architecture, you have to yeah. work with the codes, the electricity My warehouse. <laughs> Yeah, if it's Evangeline's Lego house, it's like, it's a perfect square with no windows. What do we do here? How can we make this pretty and functional? There's no door. There's no electricity. It's no running room. We're great. But it's color coordinated. That's Probably what it is. And, and yeah, that, that shows other other um, similar things like architecture, right? Yep. Uh, you'll, there's some famous examples of fancy architects who decided when they're designing a building, I'm gonna show off to my architect friends instead of making something where people live. <laughs> I think it was like a famous dorm room in like MIT or something like that where this is the case where it's like, it's not livable because the, <laughs> the architect didn't think to give the limitations like, what do human beings need to live in a place? Oh, no. <laughs> Doors. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that is one of the things where properly done, architecture should take human limitations into account and yeah. to do that well is part of being an effective architect. It's building upon limitations is really what it is. I think mm -hmm. it's it's taking it's taking limitations or or you know creating something <clears throat> excuse me creating art or creating something in light of limitations is is almost like I don't know it's not like conquering it but it's almost like building something better. I don't know. Like overcoming or triumphing yeah. triumph triumph triumphing. Yeah. Triumph triumphing. 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 Right? Is that a word? Triumphing? Triumphing over, yeah, triumphing over evil. Tri tri I mean, I'm just using that as an example. Okay. Triumphing, triumphing you're over You're probably something. right, but for some reason, I think I'm thinking of the word too. I was like, that's not a real word. It's not a word. Triumphing over tri evil. Triumphing. triumphing. No, that has to be real. It has to be real. <laughs> okay, it's like a mass <laughs> delusion we're going through. Anyway, it is we're not saying even that late. <laughs> Something's happening in our brains right now. Well, you know, the example I think of is um, uh, Michelangelo's David. Mm -hmm. Like, what could be more limiting than marble? Mm. You know? Well, especially with the tools they had to work with back then, you know? With anything. Well, with I mean, anything. I could, do you think I could <laughs> do anything with a chainsaw or, like, a laser <laughs> even? Like, I couldn't cut Michelangelo with, like, the best laser that's out there right now. 
but yeah just think of like you know the the perfection and yeah. and the yeah. limitation yeah and I, i'm sure for things like there's imperfections in the blocks of marble right um or mm -hmm. like wood carvers you'll hear like oh you need to work with the grain of the wood and some mm -hmm, piece of wood mm -hmm. have different grains that you need to work with and, mm -hmm. and again just mm -hmm. inherent in the art form working around that is a big part of the creativity of, of being a good wood carver mm -hmm. my husband is currently designing a cabinet um, made from old railroad ties that are probably well over 100 years old oh mm -hmm. yeah and um yeah, so he has no choice but to work with the weathering. Yeah. And, you know, where he's able to make cuts and, you know, so it's it's, you know, not a uniform like the the planks are not uniform, which just adds to the interest of mm -hmm. the piece. And, you know, because it's so rough, he's kind of like come up with sort of a like rustic kind of even like fairy forest which was maybe slightly influenced by me because I was like, oh, there's not, there must be dryads in this book, you know, oh because my goodness, that's, amazing. that's, you know, kind of a microcosm of our house. <laughs> I love it. That um, is so cool. But anyway, it's coming, it's so interesting to see it come together mm -hmm. um, in the way that it has to come together because of the limitations of the medium yeah. and what he's able to do with it mm -hmm. and just to see his talent at working within those limitations and making yeah. something incredible. That brings up something that I, <clears throat> I wanted to mention as well, or just as a, you know, wondering if you guys have anything to add to it. I just kind of have it as a, a mention, but we were talking about Matt and this episode for you was mostly about um, like how do limitations make our art better. But as we're talking through this stuff, I keep thinking how do limitations make us as artists? Like I just keep thinking about our character, how our character is formed by coming up against limitations and working through them or, mm -hmm. um, it, using them to foster something different and new and unexpected. I mean, that, that changes us, too, as, as the creators of the art. So mm -hmm. I know that's not te technically what the, what the topic was, but it did occur to me kind of as we were mm -hmm. to keep talking about this. And, and I thought even of Michelangelo's David. Um, I was thinking, I mean, this is, I was thinking of the Sistine Chapel, too. That was, mm -hmm. but, but I remember reading at some point, just how discouraged he was doing the Sistine Chapel ceiling and trying to do that. And it like took a lot out of him. And yet it's one of the most renowned pieces of yeah, well, he, work. He had to be like laying on his back on a rickety scaffold, like yeah. so far up above. Like it was just like, because of the limits he had, it was mm -hmm. really physically demanding. Right. No, for sure. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we have all these romantic ideals about it, but it was really, really hard for him. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, yeah, so I was just kind of thinking about, like, the, the ways that those limitations shape us as mm -hmm. artists and creators. And, um, you know, whether, you know, the way they shape us is sometimes up to us, you know, yeah. <laughs> the way yeah. we throw our tools around or, you know, mm -hmm. if you throw our laptop out the window. No, mm -hmm. I haven't done this, sure. but I do. <laughs> I, I have seen YouTube, you know. <laughs> Who hasn't been tempted? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. No, that that is a, a very fair point. You know, as artists are human beings, right? Like mm -hmm. all of us have limitations, right? Whether it's physical, whether it's family ties, work ties, uh, other things. Like we are all limited by things. It's just part of being human and part of living human life well is learning how to work within those limitations, right? Yeah. 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 And that, that sort of takes me to the, the final set of thoughts I had on this topic, uh, looking bigger picture, and that's limiting yourself with the theme or message of the work as, as a whole. I mm -hmm. love it when works do this, where you can tell there's some sort of underlying genius behind the whole thing or with some underlying idea. So a couple, couple thoughts that I had. Um, one of them is uh, this mini series this uh short animated series um over the garden wall you all mm -hmm. familiar yes oh it's so good it is yeah. i love over the garden wall so much so yeah. it premiered on a uh, cartoon network in uh, 2014 it's a series of 10 very short episodes tell a story of two kids two half brothers who sort of get lost in this sort of fairy wilderness the unknown mm -hmm. and you know there's sort of 10 distinct episodes of it i saw this very I think you would like this, Evangeline. I saw this very interesting YouTube video by this dude, uh, Trey the Explainer. He made a very compelling case that Over the Garden Wall is a riff on Dante's Inferno. Have, yes. Are you familiar with yes. this theory? Yep. I thought it was a compelling case. And yes. when you look at it, 
So basically each of the episodes are them descending through one of the levels. So there's lust, gluttony, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, a greed and going down. Mm-hmm. So I thought that, so my first thought, wow, that makes me love the series even more. Second, if you're the creator, uh, Patrick McHale, that probably helps you a lot as you're trying to think of stuff. Instead of like, mm-hmm. I need to write a fairy story here. It's like, okay, this one's exploring Dante's cantos about the dangers of greed. Okay, what are some things I can draw on? What are some things I can do there? Mm-hmm. What, what, what were your thoughts on that that theory and how I, I played into um, it? I've, I have not finished Over the Garden Wall. It's so good. I know, I love it's it. It's so I, good. I, I'm well into it, but I haven't finished it. Um, but yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, and I didn't encounter it until, you know, mm-hmm. um, after I had watched some of the episodes. Like I said, I haven't watched all of them. But yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And like, what an interesting thing to do, to be like, I'm going to write, or I'm going to create this, you this know. This kid's cartoon. This kid's, well, yeah, I mean, I mean cartoon, it, this, this cartoon work yeah. of art, you know, based on Dante's Inferno. I mean... That's just, it's just so interesting. It You're really like, is. What, where did that come? Did you wake up in the middle of the night and be like, I've got it. <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> It'll be did, a... did someone try and convince you otherwise? You I'm know what the Cartoon Network it. needs? <laughs> right. Some Dante. Some Dante. Yeah, actually, that's yeah. not far off. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but, uh, it's not untrue. But it's not untrue. It's not <laughs> something I would have thought of. <laughs> Out of the box thinkers. But, but something to that, like, I'm thinking just with my own writing and, uh, so listeners may know, I, I have this very tiny project that I've been, work, I've been working on a little bit at a time for several years, where for the past six years, every advent, I've been writing another piece of a story where it's, it's also a fairy story. And yeah, it's very small. It's mainly for, you know, my family and a few friends. Although listeners, if you want to check it out, get on my website. Um, so normally it would be tacky to spill the beans on this, but again, since it's for friends and family, who cares? <laughs> I tried to do something similar with mine, where each of the episodes, each of the years, where it's a set of four little stories, it's built around one of the cardinal virtues. So there's, um, you know, temperance, uh, prudence, justice, another one that I'm missing, then there's faith, hope, and love. And I found setting that limit on me has made writing it so much easier. So much easier. Where uh, for this year, the theme is faith. So again, if I was just like, okay, I need to write a self-contained fairy story. Ugh, they just sort of stare it out into space for a while. This one's like, okay, I want to explore like the classical conception of faith. So it was like reading some stuff. So I read something by like Pope Benedict XVI that was helpful. Then it was like, okay, so here's one extreme of faith. Here's not, and basically I had the plot set for this year just because I had those limits set on me of what, what theme I was looking at. So those limits were super helpful, just like practically for, for writing this little story for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I have kind of discovered the same thing. Like within the past couple of years, I've, you know, really honed in on what I want to spend my time writing about. And that is, you know, our experience as humans kind of on the threshold of mm-hmm. this world and, and the world we can't see. and It is freeing and exciting to know. I mean, I could talk about that and write about that for the rest of my life. I'm convinced. Right. Mm -hmm. I will, you know, I'll never get tired of that because there's so many different ways to explore that theme. Mm -hmm. And so the book that I'm working on now is like particularly about longing to escape, you know, into um, another world. And so that has helped just bring focus to my scenes, you know, because I can always come back to, well, wait, you know, if I'm lost, I'm like kind of poking around. Where does the scene go? I can always come back to, you know, that central theme that I'm trying to show through the character, Mm -hmm. show through the story and the specific scene. How Mm -hmm. can I tap into that longing to escape in Mm -hmm. this particular scene? Yeah. And it's just, it's so useful. <laughs> and like, this is such a good hack. Just, <laughs> hack. just like the train station in G.K. Cheston is shooting for Victoria. Yes, You're like, Victoria. here's my theme. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I'm going that direction. That direction. And it's funny, like, because you talked about that being a goal. Right. It is a goal. And it's also a limitation, mm-hmm. a limitation. And it's also a tool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> 
All right, well, thank you all for humoring me on another one of my little soapboxes. Jesse, you thought this episode wouldn't work. We proved you so wrong. <laughs> you should let the listeners prove him. <laughs> <laughs> I love you listeners, guys. <laughs> listeners, rate and review the show. Give this one a five star and let, let Jesse know how wrong he was. Yes, you can even <laughs> write a little note to Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway... Uh, uh, once again, you can probably tell, listeners, things are winding down at the Anselm Society Digital Pub. The fire's down to embers, the customers are trundling home, and you've polished off your final glass. Once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, please rate and review this show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next time. Mm-hmm.